Why did Pope Francis ask Ukraine to hold up the white flag? Now, he was talking about the white flag of negotiation, but to the Ukrainians, they took this as an insult because the white flag is universally known as a sign of surrender. Now, at first, the remark seems very awkward, and there was a lot of criticism regarding that remark. We'll take a look at exactly what he said, but also we'll take a look at perhaps the motivation behind why he used that term. Now, I'm not inclined to say that it was a mistake, although it could be. And the reason why I say that is the Vatican has its own State Department. They're not incompetent when it comes to diplomacy. So they tend to know what they're doing regarding relationships with other nations. And in a situation like this, where we have a large-scale war that's occurring with a very, very significant loss of life, we're thinking that the estimate is somewhere around a half a million people have died in that war, mostly Ukrainian. And that doesn't count the people who have been injured or displaced from their home. So it's a very terrible war. And unfortunately, with the aggression that we see coming from both sides, it could escalate into an extremely terrible war, one that has global consequences for everyone. Now, there's been rumors of a trip to Moscow by the Pope, and it, it's tied together with this remark. It's the reason why I mention it. And this trip has been negated, or the rumor has been negated regarding this trip by the Vatican itself. Now, as I mentioned, they have their own State Department, and they have their own press secretary. And the press secretary, in a situation like this, if the Pope was actually going to Moscow, it would be announced publicly by the Vatican. That's not something that would be done in secret. Now, there's been a long-standing desire of the Pope to go to Moscow. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in regards to how it fits in with prophecy and whether it's actually intended to be related to prophecy. And while I'm mentioning that, we're taking a look at this through the eyes of the faith. I'm not getting into politics regarding this. So I want to look at it from that perspective. How does it fit into Marian prophecy? And what are the events that these are related to? So, if the Pope is not going to Moscow, and also it seems like the we cannot conclude that the remark was made as a mistake, then why did the Pope mention the white flag in regards to Ukraine? And I'd like to take a look at this point and what he actually said. So here is it's a very short sentence, so I'm going to read this very quickly. I think that the strongest one is the one who looks at the situation and thinks about the people and has the courage of the white flag and negotiates. But then again, he went on to explain it a little further on, and he mentioned, when you see that you are defeated, that things are not going well, you have to have the courage to negotiate. And then he says, negotiations are never surrender. 
And that's true. He's not wrong in anything that he said. Although the use of the term white flags, if you actually want to prompt negotiation, was probably not the best term to use. So then why was it used? Well, I mentioned that there's rumors of the Pope going to Moscow, and these rumors have been ongoing for a long time because everyone knows that he does want to go to Moscow, whether it's to meet the authority within the Orthodox Church or to meet Vladimir Putin. He wants to go to Moscow. And my thinking is that this term of the white flag was deliberate that he wishes to ingratiate himself with Russia in order to get that invitation. And as we mentioned on this channel before, the ongoing war, if it looks like it may escalate, they may turn to people who wish to intercede for peace and bring someone in like Pope Francis with the hopes of maybe that will instill some goodwill on the part of the West. So, the other thing that came up is, is the Pope trying to, with his desire to go to Moscow, is he trying to fulfill the message of Garabandal, the requirement that the Pope goes to Moscow before the final events mentioned at Garabandal proceeds, which would be the warning and the miracle that's mentioned at Garabandal. And my thinking is that's not the motivation. And the reason why I think that is because of what was said when the consecration to the Immaculate Heart was completed by Pope Francis in early 2022. The reason why he said he did it is because he said that the bishops of Ukraine asked for it. And we talked about that a bit on this channel quite a bit already, of why they asked for it and what they thought that it meant that perhaps they were wrong in what they thought the outcome would be after the consecration. And just to touch on that, the bishops, I believe, they wanted the consecration to occur because they felt that this would prompt the same sort of outcome that occurred when Pope John Paul II consecrated or entrusted the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And after that, seven years afterwards, the Soviet Union dissolved in almost a miraculous way. It just happened so rapidly. So the thinking is maybe that those bishops thought that Russia would just disintegrate. They would just dissolve like the Soviet Union did, and they would be utterly defeated but that's not what the consecration is about. The consecration, of course, is a blessing. You're setting aside something that's being blessed. And it's actually a great gift to Russia and, and its people. And I don't think that's what the bishops of Ukraine intended. But anyway, getting back to the motivation that Pope Francis mentioned regarding the consecration, he said it was because the bishops asked him for it and that he did it out of collegiality. So he didn't do it because our Blessed Mother asked for it. He didn't do it because Jesus to Sister Lucia requested it and basically said that if you don't do it, that certain events would occur. He didn't do it for that reason. He didn't do it because heaven desires it. He did it out of collegiality. That's according to him, his own words. 
Now, he didn't mention anything about not doing it because heaven asked for it, but he mentioned that he did it out of collegiality. So, in my thinking, it's the wrong reason for doing it, but he did it notwithstanding. So, the fact that he did the consecration because of that, it tells me that he's doing this for the same reason. He views himself as someone who is relevant to all religions and is the leader of all religions. That's the way he's positioning himself. And that's one of the reasons why he engages like the Amazonian tribes or the reason why he signed what he did at Abu Dhabi, the Abu Dhabi Declaration. He wants to view himself as the leader of all religions. And he wants to include the Orthodox in that. Now, unfortunately, it's not working, not working well at all. And events that have transpired recently regarding matters such as the Pacamama scandal that occurred not that long ago in late 2019, also the recent um, the recent letter regarding the fiducia supplicants, that has caused the Orthodox to go further away from the Catholic Church and from Rome. They've even stated that in the Coptic Church just recently broke off negotiations that they had with Rome, and they mentioned that as a reason. Many bishops, Roman Catholic bishops, have also rejected that document. And I'm not going to get into the document here, but the document is, of course, because of what I just mentioned, problematic. So it not, not only has the effect of pushing the Orthodox away, and he's actually, I think, held in contempt by the Orthodox. I remember him going to Greece during a visit early on, and there was a priest, Orthodox priest, yelling at him that he was a heretic. And that was because of the Pachamama incident. So, I, I think that there's a long way to go regarding ecumenism. It seems like ecumenism has backfired. It has not worked. And I want to give some examples. So, not too long ago as well, I was speaking to someone who was a Protestant. As people who are familiar with my channel know, I speak with Protestants or I've spoken with Protestants in the past quite a bit, and that was one of my early missions to engage Protestants. But I don't do that much anymore because it's very time-consuming and my time is put elsewhere. But in this one case, I made an exception. I spent a lot of time with this person there's a lot of questions that come when a Protestant's considering conversion to Roman Catholicism. And one question leads to another question, leads to another question. So we got to the end where a decision was to be made, and this person said, I can't do it. And it's a big decision for a Protestant because in those communities, there's a tendency to have tight social networks. And when you leave Protestantism, you can lose friends, even family. You may lose support structures, such as daycare. But anyway, this person said that they can't do it. <clears throat> and the reason was none of that. The reason was this person said, I don't like what this pope is doing. And that's a problem when you talk about ecumenism, when you even hear from Protestants that they don't like the path that you're going on. 
And I hear this not from people that I've engaged with like that in that manner so deeply, but I hear it from other comments from other Protestants where they say, you're going into a bad situation and the Roman Catholic Church seems like it's falling apart. And just um, recently I had a convert to Catholicism, a very high-profiled one, Dr. Gavin Ashenden, on my channel. And we talked about that a little bit. <clears throat> I mentioned that when I spoke with Protestants, that I would tell them that you're not going to Shangri-La, you're going to enlist for the front lines of the war, the war against apostasy, when you join the Catholic Church. And he retorted that he's heard the same thing from some of his Protestant friends. He jumped from the frying pan into the fire. And he also mentioned he viewed it as going from Dunkirk to Normandy, where Dunkirk, the army, the Allied army was completely destroyed, is going to Normandy to have a, a chance in Normandy. And then there's another example where there's a priest who's very unhappy with fiducia supplicants. And he's made a remark that if the, the church goes down the road of ordaining women deacons, in other words, that would, inter that would mean that the church is introducing women to holy orders because holy orders is involved with the diaconate. He says he's out. He says he's leaving. And, and that would be a terrible thing. He's a faithful priest, a good priest, a holy priest, and he's thinking of leaving. And that's never the answer. That's not the answer. And that actually is something that's indicative of someone who does not understand the church. And both in the examples that I mentioned regarding the priest and also the Protestant that I mentioned, they don't understand what the church is. And the church is not the Pope. I said before in this channel, the popes, they come and go. And the popes have an influence at the time that we live in, but that doesn't mean that their influence will be persistent. And if you look at the history of the church, there have been many terrible popes. Well, I shouldn't say many. There have been examples of terrible popes. When I say terrible, I'm talking about all kinds of reasons for being terrible. Popes that have assumed the position uh, in the papacy just because they, they wish to have power and material influence, especially in the past when the Vatican had large states, large estates that comprise a good part of Italy. And there's other situations where popes were morally destitute you had promiscuous popes. There's one example of a pope who actually dug up his predecessor, the previous pope. He dug up his deceased predecessor and put him on trial. You have popes that have promoted heresy, and there's no doubt about that, and that's history. And there's people that are going around today <clears throat> they have this infantile view of the papacy where they wish to almost consider the Pope a deity. Well, the Pope's not a deity. He's a steward. He's a steward for the deposit of the faith, and he's a steward for evangelizing. In other words, putting forth the mission, the primary mission of the church, which is evangelization and the salvation of souls. That's what the Pope it should be involved with. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people, like I mentioned, that wish to mislead others. They wish to characterize 
not just this pope, but all popes, as being almost infallible, which they're not. <clears throat> they have, they're human. Popes are human. They have human fallibility. They sin, and they can be incorrect. They can only, they're only infallible under certain limited circumstances and when they intend to be. But unfortunately, there's a, a lot of, I would say, a cottage industry of what has been recently termed as Pope Splainers that like to clean up and whitewash not just what we hear from this Pope, like I mentioned, but all popes. And of course, they're misleading people. And, and actually, it's a problem because they tend to view everything as being correct and being something that they should promote. So even if a pope in history, or perhaps this pope, if they say something that's heretical, they defend it. And they promote it as a good. So it's a situation where you have good is evil and evil is good. And those are the worst people and the people that are have the highest tendency of misleading others and are actually leading others outside of the church, which is ironic because we call them Pope Splainers. <laughs> and Pope Splainers, you would think, want to keep people in the church, but they're actually promoting false doctrine and false history. But I want to get back to the original subject of this discussion. And I mentioned I was going to place it in the context of prophecy, Marian prophecy. So when you look at Ukraine and Russia, there's a famous interview that was done with Malachi Martin, where he actually mentions Kiev and Russia in the context of a discussion regarding the third secret of Fatima. And what he was doing there is he was tying together not just the third secret, but he was also making a reference to the apparition at Rushev in Ukraine. Rushev is a city on the border of Ukraine and Poland. He was making a reference to that apparition in 1987, where that apparition said that unless Russia converts, and again, this is 1987, when the Soviet Union was still in power. It said that if Russia does not convert, there will be a third world war, and that Ukraine has a vital role in that conversion. And that's, I'm paraphrasing that message. And Malachi Martin made a reference to that, that he said that Ukraine would be like a lever in the conversion of Russia. So that is why Russia it is so important in this conversation. And the visit to Moscow, it is one that's been prophetically documented at Garbandal as well, and mentioned at Rushev. And I would add that people are not thinking about the role Ukraine has in this prophecy correctly. And it's true often with prophecy, the expectation is different than what actually occurs. And the expectation seems to be predominantly that Ukraine is going to defeat Russia. And that does not appear to be happening. Going back to what the Pope said about the circumstances, he said that when it looks like it's not going well, have the courage to uphold the white flag of negotiation. And he's correct about that. It is not going well. And has not been going well for a long time. And it's getting worse. And 
I'm someone who is very interested in peace there, because as our Blessed Mother said in Rushev, unless Russia converts, there will be a, a Third World War. And the Third World War will not be like World War I, World War II. World War I and World War II seen a great deal of people that or armies that are moving to and fro across landscapes. That does not appear to be the scenario we'll see with World War III. And World War II also, which is kind of the type of way people are looking at what the conflict in Ukraine and Russia, we have armaments that would not be that useful in World War III. A good example would be, let's take the, an example of the war in Iraq, where you would have aircraft carriers playing an important role. You have troops landing there playing an important role. It's almost like a World War II type of event. That's not World War III. In World War III, troop movements would be met and seen by satellites and by other means of observation, and they would be destroyed remotely. It would be a war raged with missiles and drones and those type of technologies and satellites. So things like aircraft carriers, they would have a very short shelf life. They would are like floating targets, floating bullseyes. They would not be that helpful at all. They're actually a liability in a World War III scenario. And unfortunately, missiles are much more dangerous, not just because they could be nuclear, but because of the range, not need to have an army land in Germany or France. It does not take long to launch a missile. So it's a war that we definitely need to avoid. And once that escalates, it can escalate extremely quickly. And let's just take a, an example. The French have recently, they've been talking about sending troops to Ukraine. Well, what would happen in the event that there is an attack on, say, a Russian city or a Russian naval vessel? Now, rightly or wrongly, it may be perceived that it came from the French. And the retaliation may not be limited to Ukraine. They may be trading a city like Bulgarod in Russia for Lyon in France. Are they willing to make that trade? Are they willing to suffer an attack on their homeland or against their fleet? And after that would occur, what would be the next step? What would be the retaliation from the French? And you can see it could escalate extremely quickly we could wake up one morning, it could be that quick, and we could be in a major war, a war that does not seem to have an end, except through death and destruction. So I'm very concerned about that. And I hope and pray that the Pope, if he did go to Moscow, would have an effect Although that does not seem to be what the message of Garabandal says regarding the Pope going to Moscow. The message of Garabandal says that the war will escalate after the Pope returns from Moscow, and it will precipitate the events that have been prophesied at Garabandal, like I mentioned, the warning and the miracle. In other words, God would intervene so when we talk about some of the things that I mentioned, and I, I brought up that the Pope is not the Church, I want to make sure that we understand, because I, I receive a lot of comments that are negative 
about the Pope, and some positive ones too, but mostly negative. I would say easily 90% of them are negative, some of them very negative. Now, we have to respect the office of the papacy, and we shouldn't be Pope bashers. So, I mentioned Pope Splainers. Well, the other side of the coin is Pope bashers, and we should not do that. Although the Pope is not the church, and our faith is not, and our sanctification is not dependent upon the Pope directly, indirectly it is, because the papacy has been given the keys by Jesus and is responsible for passing down the deposit of the faith and for promoting the faith. And there are strongholds of the faith that exist today, and they're not going anywhere. And you people who are upholding the faith, you are the church. So you should never say that you're leaving the church. I'm especially thinking of that priest right now who said he's out if certain events happen. Well, he's not out. He, if you're upholding the faith and you believe yourself to be a good Catholic, then you are the church. And I recommend everyone to take that position. Concern yourself with your own sanctification. Not worry about what you see around you. I want to thank you for joining. As always, God bless.